the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with our work, is a social justice organization uh, devoted and committed to upholding the U.S. Constitution and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, the Center has worked to protect the constitutional right to dissent for social movements, um, to defend political prisoners, and has stood up for uh, people that have experienced uh, either racial or religious profiling and discrimination. It's, very, it's an opportune uh, time to be here. This is the first time that the U.S. is actually being reviewed under the universal periodic review process, and um, clearly the U.S. is falling behind. Um, in terms of meeting its rights obligations and um, meeting its compliance with international human rights treaties, particularly around issues of freedom of speech, freedom of association, uh, upholding uh, uh, due process, standing up and, and fighting against and putting measures against uh, racial or religious discrimination, just to name a few issues. And so this opportunity allows us to shine a light on these stories that are otherwise unheard or unknown, um, particularly stories that the U.S. federal government is trying to keep from the mainstream, uh, from the public domain, and from the public discourse. Um, I'd like to focus today on one particular case study, and if we have more time, we can kind of zoom out and talk about some of the larger issues. Uh, particularly, I'd like to tell you about um, the CMU's Communications Management Units, which are units within the federal prison system. Um, which we're quite, quite concerned about. Um, the CMU, the Communications Management Units, were set up in 2006 and 2008 by the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, they were designed to isolate and segregate certain prisoners within the federal prison from the rest of the Bureau of Prisons population and from the rest of the world. Uh, currently, there are two CMUs. Uh, one is located in Terre Haute, Indiana. The other one is located in Marion, Illinois. Between the two of them, um, they house between 60 and 70 prisoners. And over two-thirds of the population is Muslim. Even though Muslims only represent 6% of the federal prison population. I'll do the math for you. That's a 1,200% um, over-representation uh, within these units. Now, the Center for Constitutional Rights uh, filed a federal lawsuit in the District Court of Columbia in March of this past year on behalf of several plaintiffs, that's five prisoners and two of their wives. Uh, we're suing the Attorney General, Eric Holder. We're suing the Director of the Bureau of Prisons, Harley Lappin, and the Assistant Director under him, um, Scott Dodrill, as well as the Federal Bureau of Prisons. We're extremely concerned because there's issues of lack of due process, there's racial and religious profiling, um, as well as many concerns um, that we think is poignant to talk about today during the first review of the U.S. Uh, particularly, uh, our clients, uh, we have five men that are in, at the CMU. All of them are either low or medium security. They have very clean disciplinary histories. Not a single one of them has received any communications-related infractions within the last decade nor have either of them had any significant disciplinary offices. <coughs> Yet, like so many of the men that were sent to these particular units, they, were not received, they did not receive any procedural protections related to their designations. They were not allowed to examine why or refute or, uh, or be allowed to participate in the review process for why they were sent to the CMUs. They were given a sheet of paper that said that they were uh, likely to be participating in the recruitment and radicalization of other prisoners, and as a result, they were sent to the CMU. Um, they expect to send, uh, spend all of their time at the CMUs, um, and there is no availability or no method to get back into the general prison population, which is clearly a due process violation. And when there is a due process violation, we see um, retaliatory transfers. We see transfers made on the basis of uh, both race and religion or protected political beliefs. It's under our belief that the, the men that we represent were sent based on these religious or perceived political beliefs or in retaliation for protected activities under the First Amendment. Um, now let's talk particularly about the population and, and take a deeper look. So um, the, the population is about two-thirds Muslims spread across two different units. 
Um, and again, that's an overrepresentation of about 1,000 or 1,200 um, percent. Now, the Muslims that are in these prison units are both of uh, South Asian or Arab descent, um, many of which were convicted for material, relate, uh, material support related charges, and African American Muslims who've converted during their time in the prison um, system. Now, uh, media started getting really concerned about these units. No one really knew anything about them, and they started putting out articles and saying, you know, why is this uh, a Muslim prison unit? Um, in fact, the prisoners within the unit call it Little Guantanamo because of how many Muslims are there. So the Bureau of Prisons got very concerned and threw in a couple of folks to mix it up. They were called the balancers by the prison guards. Um, in fact, they are individuals with unpopular political views, all protected under the First Amendment, um, such as environmental activists and animal rights activists. And this is part of a growing uh, trend which stretches the terrorist label to include uh, folks that are working on animal rights and environmental rights issues. Uh, so this is what we call, we're calling the Green Scare, modeled after the Red Scare uh, several years ago. So we see people being sent to the CMUs if they are organizing prisoner rights, if they are organizing prison worship, if they are filing grievances based on conditions of confinement, um, or maintaining that they've been mistreated. Uh, now the Bureau maintains that there's these you know, very wide guidelines about who is being sent to these units, but we have to question who is being sent there and why. We're really concerned about the fact that the CMUs are an experiment in social isolation. There's a categorical ban on physical contact. And if these prisoners are being sent, if these men are being sent to these units to have their communications monitored, we want to know why they can't hug their children. Um, there is a categorical physical ban. So uh, the men in the CMU are not able to have any type of physical contact with their children, their spouses, their loved ones. They can't hug them. They can't touch them to say goodbye. Uh, we, we have some men that don't, haven't touched their children in, in three years. They haven't been able to hug them. They haven't been able to pat their back when their daughters won science fairs. Um, and we know that the, the BOP is saying that the reason for these restrictive conditions is because we need to monitor the communications of certain prisoners, but you have to wonder, you know, if the visitors are comprehensively searched before they enter the, the, the CMU to visit their loved one, and if the prisoner is strip searched, then why, and these units are communications management units, why is there a categorical ban on physical contact? And it's, it's interesting because this is in violation of the Bureau of Prisons' own standards, which knows that there is a critical importance of visit, um, visitation. They know that there is um, importance when this relates to rehabilitation and re-entry after one serves a sentence. Um, and it's very interesting to note that the CMU's visitation policy is more restrictive than the Supermax prisons. And these are notorious prisons. Um, and over there, the prisoners have four times more, uh, four, sorry, four times more time allowed for visits than the prisoners in the CMUs. Uh, in addition to the, the complete uh, lack of ability to touch your loved ones, to hug them, we have extreme uh, restrictions on phone access. You have two 15-minute phone calls every week. Now, we represent a client who has five children. And every time he has to get on the phone, they have to divide up the 15 minutes between the mom five children, his ailing parents, um, his brothers and sisters, and there's brother and sisters-in-law. And you imagine what happens when you're the last kid who gets the phone and you have 30 seconds to talk to your father. And the next time that you're going to be able to chat is while you're in school. Uh, in fact, before the beer prisons modified some of their, their time restrictions, one mother had to drive to school, take her two daughters out of class, bring them into the parking lot, pass the cell phone between the two of them, they'd start sobbing because they're having an emotional conversation with their father and they'd have to pick themselves up and drive their tears and go back to school. Um, we're interested in the fact that other BOP prisoners are receiving 300 minutes a month, but our prisoners in the CMUs are receiving only two 15-minute phone calls per week. Additionally, we're very much concerned as this violates the Bureau of Prisons' own policies about having access to education and having access to um, classes will, that will further and re, uh, allow you to rehabilitate better when you're re-entering into society. Um, we're also concerned, and I know that we're running out of time here, about uh, what are the implications on freedom of association. Uh, 
why there are instances of cruel and unusual punishment, uh, why freedom of speech and religion is being threatened here, and uh, violations of equal protection. Uh, now one more thing of note, uh, before setting up any type of rule or new type of prison, the Bureau of Prisons is obligated to set up a period of public comment where the public can weigh in about these types of units. Now in 2006, they set up a, uh, a period of public comment around what were similar units. There was so much outroar that they were like, okay, we're not going to do that. But then they quietly set up the Bureau of Prisons, uh, the CMUs, anyways. And only after one week after we filed our lawsuit did they open up the period of public comment. And we had a large group of civil rights and civil liberties organizations, the CMU prisoners themselves, former correction officers, environmental and animal rights activists coming together to flood the Bureau of Prisons and say that this is not okay, we're not going to stand for this. This is in clear violation of the U.S. Constitution and of international human rights treaties, which we've signed. Um, I'd like to conclude by saying that everyone, including prisoners within these uh, units, have to receive their constitutionally protected rights to due process and equal treatment, and that these units must reach uh, the constitutional standards and the standards of the Federal Bureau of Prisons' own standards, or they need to be shut down. Uh, I'll take two seconds to talk about the recent FBI raids. Five weeks ago, the FBI raided uh, peaceful anti-war and international solidarity activists in Chicago and Minnesota. This is part of a, a long-standing repression on dissent. Uh, it is a continued process of McCarthyism, Quintel Pro, and an attack on animal rights, uh, environmental justice, peace, and anti-war activists. This comes as no surprise. These are manifestations of the same system, and they are obviously in violations of the U.S. Constitution and international rights treaties to which we have ratified.